some of the details of GSM. So, maybe if you move to slide 29, okay. somewhere around there is where we have been talking about that <coughs> there would be an MA mobile node. BTS is basically what we understand as the base station. Okay, BSC is the base station controller, MSC is the mobile station controller and so on. Okay. So, we will go a little bit more into details about how the GSM air interface is first structured and then we will come back to look at how roaming works and other uh, such issues. Okay. Again, let us not uh, go through all the slides sequentially. Let us just go ahead and try to do it as though it did not exist and we are inventing it. Okay. So, just to quickly uh, uh, recap, we have now GSM operates in the 900 megahertz band, right. <coughs> so, we know that which is basically 890 to 915 megahertz and uh, this is the uplink and 935 to 960 megahertz downlink, right. We have seen that it has 125 channels, 200 kilohertz. Okay. This is what is called the physical structure of the system. Okay. This is the physical structure of your <coughs> GSM system. Okay. Now, we want to understand how this, what is the logical structure of the system. Right. So, let us try to ask a few questions. One is, what happens during power on, right? Outgoing call, incoming call, okay? <coughs> See, the reason why we are uh, trying to do this in this manner is that as it is, it is very dry, okay? There is a lot of acronyms and lot of really, <coughs> you know, dry description. And if we take it at 2.30 in the afternoon after a nice lunch, then I can kind of anticipate the effect. So, let us try to do it in a different way. Let us try to understand why it is set up like this. So, that is the objective. So, what it is can be found in a book. Okay. Why it is is something which is a little bit more involved. Okay. <clears throat> so, again keep in mind the objective, what is the objective now in a GSM system? I am paying a lot of money for licensing. Okay. Always keep that in mind. I am paying a lot of money for licensing. I need to extract the maximum juice out of my system in order to make profit and so on. Okay. <clears throat> so, now what we are saying is, so think of it, think of it this way. Suppose the power on everything is established and I want to establish an outgoing call. Okay. Would I allocate one slot straight away? Right. So, the question is like this. If you see, this is how the, this is what we have understood so far. Okay, 935 megahertz to 960 megahertz is the downlink, which has 125 channels. Each channel is split into um, eight slots. Similarly, there is a 890 to 915 megahertz. Each channel is split into eight slots. Okay, <clears throat> so let me ask a question here. Why is 890 to 915 the downlink? Oh, sorry, the uplink and not the downlink. Okay. So, the reason here, so the point I want to illustrate is that all of these numbers have some logic behind them. Okay. <clears throat> so, it could well have been the other way. I mean, if we are just doing it in theory, it does not matter which one is uplink, which one is downlink. But it turns out that what you want to do is you want to conserve the battery power of the mobile for as long as possible. right? So, now if it is transmitting at a lower frequency, it is going to consume less power. So, that is the reason why you have uh, the uplink as 890 to 915 megahertz and the downlink is at the higher uh, frequency because that would require more power, but the base station anyway is uh, powered up. So, that does not matter as far as the base station is concerned. Okay. All right. So, given that we are doing like this, so the question now is, that as soon as somebody wants to establish a call, 
do we just pick up one of these slots and allocate it to that mobile? Okay. <coughs> All right. See, the, the key reason is unless you are sure that the call is going to happen, there is no point in tying up the entire resources. So, you want to delay tying up of resources for as long as possible, right? That is the key idea. You want to delay this tying up of resources. So, how do I decide whether the call will be established or not? What are the parts involved in establishing a call? This mobile has to request for a channel, then the network has to see whether the, where the other guy is, right? And then the network has to figure out whether that it has to give a ringing tone on the other, other side, that guy has to pick up, only then the conversation happens. So, there are several steps in a call to take place, correct? And there is no point in allocating a traffic channel, what is called a traffic channel, till all these steps are successful, correct? So, each time I just simply request something, if a slot is allocated, then that slot goes, could go waste for several frames, okay? So, that is the key idea here that logical channels are split into what are called control channels and traffic channels, okay? <clears throat> what is a logical channel now? What is a physical channel? One of these things is a physical channel, okay? Time slot uh, 1 in frequency number 123 on the up down link, okay? So, that is how you will define a physical channel, okay? What is a logical channel? <coughs> the logical channel is the same physical channel which repeats every once in a while, right? It, it occurs here, then after 8 slots it is going to occur again. So, when you put all those things together, that is what you are kind of calling as a logical channel, okay? So, if I say that uh, frequency number x time slot y is your traffic channel, you know that every time when frequency x comes in time slot y, I am going to transmit my voice packet, okay? So, that is the meaning of a logical channel, all right? <coughs> so, one thing which we have discovered is in order to extract the maximum utilization out of our system, we need to split our channels into traffic channels and control channels, right? So, now the question remains is to figure out how do we utilize these control channels, okay? What are the different control channels that we need, okay? So, these three questions will actually help us to figure that out. So, what happens when the mobile node powers up, okay? What are the things that I need to know upon powering up? Okay, power on. So, what, what do I need to know? I need to, I need to register with the, okay, register with the network, okay. How do I do this? How do I know that the network exists when I power on? Beacon, heartbeat, okay. So, basically what will happen is the first thing is base station has to transmit something like a beacon, okay. Now, this beacon occurs in almost every type of wireless technology in one form or another, okay? Sometimes it is called a beacon, sometimes it is called a hello packet, okay? Sometimes it is just called a broadcast packet, all right? <coughs> so, base station has to transmit some something like a beacon, okay? In this case, it is not a beacon. In GSM system, it is not called a beacon. It is called a broadcast control channel, okay? <coughs> So, how do I know that I am receiving the beacon? Is the question making sense? See, finally all said and done, it is a string of zeros and ones. How do I know that I am receiving a beacon now? There are so many channels. How do I know which channel the beacon is being transmitted on? I am the mobile node, okay? There is a base station out there. I know that there are 125 channels on the downlink. I know that the mobile node, uh, the base station is going to be transmitting the beacon on one of these channels. How do I know which one? So, either I could have a fixed channel assigned for transmitting the beacon, correct? <coughs> so, base station has to transmit a beacon. So, the question that arises, so if you try to answer these questions, see what is happening. So, for each question, we are coming up with some answer and then some other question associated with it. That is how the whole technology develops. Okay. So, base station has to transmit a beacon. Moment you say that, we ask the question which channel? 
Okay, so this is just one step of the registration. In that itself, we are already asking the question which channel. So now, for which channel, we have two options, right? We have fixed okay, frequency x times slot y. Okay. Suppose we decide <coughs> that frequency x times slot y will be the channel on which I transmit the beacon. Okay. What is the implication of such a decision? One has to wait till wait till what time? Time slot is just 577 microseconds, right? 1.4 micros 1.4 seconds means it's going to uh, come. I have to scan the frequencies. Do I have to scan the frequencies? If I know that this is frequency x, I just go to frequency x, right? So those are not drawbacks. So what is the drawback? There is a dedicated channel. So what is the plus points of this? is that this is easy to find, right? It is easy for the mobile node to find that frequency x channel y, okay? But if you see what are the minus points of doing such a thing, okay, what is the key minus point? One channel will be wasted because I have to keep sending this broadcast information all the time, okay? That cannot be helped. What could be a key drawback? See, we have 125 channels for the entire spectrum. Okay. How many operators are there in any given area, GSM operators? Are all 125 channels made available to every operator? Right. If I make all 125 channels available to every operator, what will happen? And two of them will put up a base station in the same area, right? And then you are going to have interference, right? So that is not the way the allocation happens. So the allocation will happen like this. The government will say, okay, I am going to give uh, these many channels to one operator, these many channels to another operator, these many channels to a third operator and so on, right? So that is the, that again is done by the telecom regulatory authority, okay? So for example, in uh, European countries, you have about 18 channels per operator. 18 channels are given to each operator, okay? In India, it is about 9. <coughs> Each operator gets about 9 channels in which to manage the system, right? Because all the operators together can have to stay within this range. Sometimes, the, if the number of operators exceeds the number of channels, then what do we do? Okay, then that is a bad regulatory mechanism, okay? Then you will keep on increasing the licensing fee, right? Till some of those guys find it economically unviable. See, that is the game, right? You keep on making it harder and harder, making the entry level harder and harder, so that only a few guys can finally remain. See, it's a very limited resource that you're playing with, right? So that's the game you have to play. Okay. At some point, you're going to finish an operator, however successful may find that he has run out of channels. What does he do? That's why you have frequency reuse. That's why you make smaller and smaller cells. Okay, you put up more and more base stations. Okay, all that fails. Sometimes you might say, okay, that's the maximum capacity of the system, right? Okay. <clears throat> so coming back to this, so now can you tell me what is the key drawback of fixing this frequency x time slot y? So every operator will have a separate frequency. That happens even today, but. If I hard code frequency x time slot y into the mobile, then I can't do I can't do roaming. You see what I'm saying? If I hard coded it into the mobile, that frequency x time slot y, then I can only work with that operator only in that area. I cannot roam because the other operator is going to use a different frequency a and time slot b, which I don't know about, right? because this is power on, right? If I could receive the beacon, from the beacon I could say, okay, this is the frequency on which the broadcast is happening. But before receiving the beacon itself, I don't know. So this is like you get stuck at the first point itself. <coughs> so this is no, okay? You cannot do any roaming if you are going to use a fixed mechanism of identifying this. Is that making sense to everybody? Okay. So we agree that we should go for a dynamic mechanism, right? Yes or no? 
Yes. So given that, how do I find out which channel? Same problem. <coughs> so now I know that I need some dynamic mechanism, I can't do fixed. How do I find out which channel is the beacon coming on? I scan the channels and no code. What? I can't find any format. See, think of it like this, okay? You have eight slots, right? So, which means I have to scan each channel, scan at least eight slots in each frequency channel, then move to the next channel, then move to the next channel, then move to the next channel. That's the way I have to move in order to find out whether there exists a beacon in my system or not. Okay, is there an easier way of doing that? We can fix the time slot within every channel. Mm, not really done, but it is not, uh, I do not think it is incorrect to do that. Okay. So, what is done is very straightforward. See, again, you want a very simple solution. What is that? What could it be? It is a channel on which there is the highest power. Okay. See, because that is what the mobile has in its hand at that moment. Okay. It cannot decode any signals. It has not understood, it has not synchronized with the base station. Right? It does not know how far away it is from the base station. It does not know what is the clock frequency of the base station, nothing. But it can always measure the received signal strength because that is a very, very basic measurement which can be performed by the device independent of whether it is registered or whether it is connected or anything. Right? Okay. <coughs> it has to ch scan through all the 125 channels or whatever, all the channels of that operator. Okay. If it is, so that is why whenever you power on, it takes a while for your, you know, that uh, antenna stick to appear on your mobile, right. The signal strength stick takes a while to appear every time you power on because the mobile has to scan all the channels and then it looks for the channel which has the highest signal strength, highest received power. That too, it does not know that this is the broadcast control channel. It assumes that this may be the broadcast control channel and then tries to decode the information. If it is able to then decode, then it knows that okay, I got it right. Otherwise, it goes to the next highest power channel and next highest power channel and so on. Okay, is that making sense? Okay. So, let us say we figured out this thing. So, this is called the broadcast control channel BCCH. Okay, this is the most important control channel in your uh, GSM system. Okay. What is the information that has to come on this channel? Hmm? Okay. So, the information that comes on this channel is frequency correction. Okay. There's lots of these uh, acronyms exist. Okay. There is frequency correction. First, you have to align in frequency with the base station. right? You may be slightly off. I mean, these are all very low level electrical stuff. Okay, you may be slightly off, but it will make a difference. So, you align in frequency and you have to synchronize with the base station. Okay. Synchronization channel. So, there is a frequency correction channel, there is a synchronization channel. What other information comes along with the BCCH? What is the information? Suppose think of it as a packet that is being transmitted. Think of the beacon as a packet which is being transmitted by my base station. What will go inside that packet? What should go inside that packet? Cell ID, okay. Then timing reference. Location means what? Cell ID. Subscriber is the mobile node, the complement of the subscriber, right? Network ID, operator ID. Okay. So, this is some of the key information which your broadcast control channel has to carry. Okay, what is the cell ID? What is the operator ID? So, it, it has to say orange, this, that, what not. Otherwise, the, how does the mobile know which network is it listening to? Correct? So, cell ID, operator ID, then it will give a frequency correction and then there is a timing reference channel. Okay. <coughs> What happens after that? We will come to the details of how the timing happens. Okay, what happens after that? So, the base station has transmitted the beacon. Then, what do I do? I have synchronized in frequency, I have synchronized in time. Okay, synchronizing in time is not very easy. We will get to that. So, that I know where I am. 
is just a B, BTS ID, cell ID or the BTS ID. It is called the BTS ID also. Okay. So, the next step that should happen is, so assuming that the timing has been synchronized, so the step 2, next thing that it does is after the, um, so basically what has to happen is mobile, okay, so the first thing that happened in power on was that the base station told the mobile that it exists, correct? Does the base station know that the mobile exists? No. So, that is the next thing that has to happen in your power on scenario. The mobile has to now somehow notify the base station that it exists. How always means which channel at this point, right? Which channel do I send this information in? The mobile is just powered on, it is scanning all the channels one by one. It finds one channel which has the highest power. It says that okay, this may be the broadcast control channel, it monitors that channel to see that is there a frequency correction uh, sequence that is coming in this channel. Once that comes, it says okay, I am corrected, I am synchronized in frequency with the base station. Then it looks for some timing information, so that it now knows what is the need for the timing information, so that it can, ha, huh, it can align itself in time with the base station, right? So what the base station thinks as slot 3 should be the same as what the mobile thinks as slot 3. If they are different, then there is going to be chaos in the system, right? Somebody is going to transmit at some point, somebody else is going to, you know, transmit at some other point, right? So all that it has managed to do. So it is now aligned in frequency, it is now aligned in time. Now it has to tell the base station that it exists. Reverse control channel, correct. We need some reverse control channels. So how do we set up these reverse control channels? That is the question, right? So how is, we need some uplink control channels or reverse or uplink, okay. <coughs> some reverse or uplink control channel, that is not its name, that is a different name. Randomly I try to transmit in any channel, you know all you people are uh, speaking, I just come there, I power on, I randomly transmit what happens to your conversation. I cannot do that, you know, so, the question is not making sense I guess. So I need to find out which channel in which to transmit my uplink information. How do I know which channel? Fixed again we have figured out, right? Fixed does not work. Fixed will lead us into some problem or the other. As far as the, even for the beacon, we tried the fixed as the simple thing, correct? So, huh, channel information will come along the BCCH. So, that is all along with operator ID, I will say which is the uplink info channel, okay? It is not called the uplink info channel, I am just calling it like that for ease of understanding. Okay, let us say, so let us say that frequency x time slot y was the BCCH and I go into the BCCH and I find that for the uplink info, it is some other channel, you know, frequency A time slot B, okay. So I know that this is some channel. How do I transmit on that channel? Suppose two of us have powered on at the same time, what kind of mechanism should I use? random, okay. So, because it is a very straightforward thing, we do not really care if two people collide, then let them back off, let them come back and try again. So, basically this is what is called your random access channel, okay, or the RACH. This is the key uplink channel, okay. So, the random access channel uses slotted aloha as the mechanism, okay. Slotted because we are in a slotted system, aloha basically means you just randomly get up and transmit, that is all it means, right? Aloha means you just transmit, slotted aloha means you transmit at the beginning of the slot, you cannot transmit anywhere in between, that is all, right? So, in the random access channel, I am going to send my registration packet, correct? <coughs> so, what are you going to say? You are going to say that I exist, that is all you can say, because sir, you do not want to tie up that channel for very long either. Right? We do not want to stay on the random access channel and prevent somebody else from transmitting. Two things can happen. You might or somebody else may transmit and corrupt your data. So you can send only a small amount. Whenever you are sending information at random in a broadcast medium, you can send only small amount of information. So basically all you can say is that you exist and you ask for a 
So, it is it's something like you say I exist and then you ask for a another control channel okay? uh, information exchange channel let me call that as information exchange channel right you say that there is no i don't want to do a lengthy information exchange with the base station on a random access channel so on the random access channel i only notify the base station that i exist now give me some channel on which i can talk to you okay that's all it means give me some other channel on which i can talk to you okay so what's the third thing that happens okay this is called the dedicated control channel so, you are saying that give me a dedicated control channel on which I can exchange authentication information with you, I can exchange you know privileges, capac uh, capabilities all those things away from the random access channel. Okay, is that making sense? Okay. So, what is the next thing that should happen? Channel assignment. So, this channel has to be assigned. right? So, BS assigns dedicated control channel correct bs can assign the dedicated control channel how just picks one it has n number of channels available to it it just picks one and says okay this is the dedicated control channel so that's the easy question the harder one is how does it inform the mobile load right assigns the dedicated control channel and notifies correct so, it can assign it by just picking one which it has 10 channels which are free at that point it may just pick one of them and say okay this is the channel that is free and it can assign it correct. So, how does it notify it back to the mobile node now that we know that there are so many different types of channels we just say okay there will be one more channel in which it is doing that correct that is basically what happens. So, it notifies it on what is called the access grant channel. So, the access grant channel has to come in the beacon. So, the beacon has to contain all this information. So, now you know when you look at a beacon you know why each of those items are there. Okay. The access grant channel information has to come in the beacon. So, that once the mobile node has sent its request for the dedicated control channel it is going to move to the access grant channel and keep listening. You know is there any access assignment which has been allocated to me. Okay. <coughs> then what happens? then it is pretty much straightforward. See once the access grant channel is there then both of these guys know that dedicated control channel is whatever frequency m time slot n. Okay. So, everybody knows not everybody the base station and the mobile node know that they are going to exchange their control information on this frequency m time slot n. So, they go ahead to that they exchange the control information whatever HLR update has to happen that happens right whatever authentication has to happen that happens right it checks whether it has roaming privileges checks whether this is an authenticated base station right you may even have fake base stations right even the mobile node has to authenticate the base station so all the authentication everything happens and that is the stable state after the power on okay which is the dedicated channel in the downlink Okay. <clears throat> what is the significance of such a question? See the significance is that this channel is in both directions. So far we had the broadcast control channel is only in the downlink direction. We have the random access channel only in the uplink direction. right? Again access grant channel only in the downlink direction. right? But the dedicated control channel has to be in both the directions because I need to send information to the base station, base station has to send information to me. Right? And now what I have written here is that dedicated control channel is frequency m time slot n. Okay. <coughs> how do I know which is it uh, how do I say which is whether this is for uplink or for downlink. So, one way of doing it is very straightforward see the brute force method is always straightforward. Right? I could always send two different information to the mobile node I could always say that this is the one for uplink this is the one for downlink that is easy, but that is tedious can we do something smarter that is the question. How do I know which one uh, whether to use the same one. So, if you see this figure you see that there is something which is shown as a delay. Okay. So, what is done is for any 
in a GSM system, any two-way channel, we use the same frequency number and the time slot number. Okay. See, for example, this is frequency channel 123. Okay. This is also frequency channel 123. Okay. So, the channel ID is the same, 123. But the frequency in which they are operating is different, right? Right? This guy is in some 914.8 to something. This guy is from 959.8 to something. But they are both frequency channels. So this is frequency channel 123 on the downlink. This is frequency channel 123 on the uplink. Okay. So when I'm assigned frequency channel 123 time slot 3 as my dedicated control channel or as my traffic channel, it also means that frequency channel 123 time slot 3 is my corresponding uplink channel. Okay. So that uh, coupling is understood. That is the that's where they use a little bit of intelligence. So now what happens here is now both of these cannot be happening at the same time, right? I cannot be receiving and transmitting at the same time. So there is an offset between the uplink sequencing and the downlink sequencing. So there is an offset of three. So three slots. So what this means is <coughs> if I am receiving data on frequency channel x time slot y, then on the corresponding uplink frequency, after three more time slots, I will transmit the data. So I do not even have to keep track of which is the slot ID. I just know that okay, I have received it in this slot, after three slots I am going to transmit. Okay? That is the way it works. So again it is a simplification for easily understanding. Uh, or easily computing which is a channel. Okay. All right. Let us see what happens now when we have a incoming call. Which one shall we do first, incoming or outgoing? Incoming. incoming. Okay. Let us do an incoming call. Incoming call means let us say from a PSTN somebody is dialing your mobile number. Okay. How does your mobile ring? First thing is base station sends it on the, it has to page for the mobile, right? What we just worked out before going for lunch, I have to do some paging in those cells saying where is this guy? Where is mobile X? Okay, then allocation of dedicated channel for response. How do I know which cell to allocate in? I am paging in multiple cells. Paging will always happen in multiple cells. See what is happening. The mobile, the dedicated control channel is also not going to last forever, right? The dedicated control channel is also given for only a certain amount of time till the authentication everything is done. Then you want to release the channel. Why do you want to release the channel? So that that resource is available for traffic, correct? You do not want to tie it up. So <clears throat> moment the mobile hears paging on random access channels, right? So the mobile will say, will try to access the network on your random access channel. Again, this is kind of a I exist message. Okay. It's basically going to send a message on the random access channel that okay, here I am. Right? Then access grant channel, okay. Then dedicated control channel. Okay. Okay, now is a good time to introduce its full name. SDCCH. <coughs> so SDCCH stands for standalone dedicated control channel. Okay, so on the access grant channel, it's going to say, let's talk on SDCCH. Okay, that's basically what the base station is going to say. Let's talk on SDCCH, and then SBS. Okay, SDCCH is a two-way channel in which you will again, you know, exchange capabilities. And then we'll do ringing. Okay, we'll say that there is an incoming call. Okay, so the mobile will ring, and then when this guy pick up, okay, so when you pick up, that's when the traffic channel is established. Okay, the traffic channel gets established once you say, okay, I pick up. The MSE is going to page to different BSCs. The BSE is going to also page in all itself. Okay, but when it comes to the cell, 
it is a base station which has to transmit the request on a particular frequency and a particular channel. So, that is called the paging channel. Okay, is that making sense? BCCH, right? So, all that information has to come in the BCCH, which is the paging channel, which is the access grant channel, everything it has to know. So, once it has finished authentication, which channel is the mobile monitoring? Paging channel, right? Once I have finished authentication, I have finished everything, then I will go and sit on the paging channel in case there is an incoming message. In case of an outgoing call, that does not matter because the device somebody is going to dial on the device and then outgoing can start from this point, correct. Mobile will just send a random access channel message. So, this is so the outgoing is actually a subset of the incoming as far as the air interface actions are concerned, right. Is that making sense? Suppose it is outgoing, mobile is going to send a message on the random access channel saying I exist, give me a SDCCH. Okay, that is what it is going to say on the random access channel. So, then the base station is going to give it an SDCCH on the access grant channel. On the uh, SDCCH what is going to happen is now it is going to say dial some XYZ number, okay. some ringing is going to happen at the other end. Okay, which may be a PSTN number, which may be whatever number. Basically, that information it is going to just pass on to the base station, right. Then this is like ringing at other party and then finally, you are again going to come back. Once the other party picks up, you are going to get assigned a traffic channel, okay. TCH is basically the traffic channel. TCS is voice data exchange. Before that, there is no TCH. For transferring voice data, that is when we are going to use the TCH. Okay. Now, so, now just see if you understand everything now. Okay. Base station, there is one base station per cell. So, the base station provides basically signaling channels, data channels. Okay. There is a random access channel. Okay. Base station is identified by some base station code. Okay. Base station controller does all these jobs of radio resource management. This is what we saw earlier. Okay, time and frequency synchronization signals are sent to the base station. Time delay measurements are made. Okay. Power management is done. All right. Mobile switching <coughs> center is going to do all these mobility of subscribers and all these kind of things. Okay, I think we have finished with most of these topics. Gateway connects to the mobile network to a fixed network. Okay. <coughs> Coming to the air interface, we have seen all these things, 124 channels of 200 kilohertz everything. Okay. Okay. There is a notion of a burst, burst basically means packet. Okay. So, what we understand in ethernet as a frame, what we understand in IP as a packet, okay. what we understand in TCP as a segment is called a burst in GSM. So, there are four different types of packets. Normal burst is the one which uh, corresponds to data transfer. Okay. <coughs> so, look at this. <coughs> so, the normal burst looks like this. It has a 3 bit header. So, how does a typical uh, frame look in uh, Ethernet? I have a header, I have a payload, and I have a I have a CRC. Yeah, I have a trailer. So, why does this frame look different? So, see what, what you have, we have a 3 bit header, 57 data bits, there is 1 bit here, there is some 26 bits of training sequence, there is another 1 bit here, 57 data bits, another 3 bits and some 8.25 guard bits. Okay. Why does it look like this? Why does not it look like the ethernet itself? You know, A header followed by data followed by a uh, error correction. Okay. <coughs> See, so let us say you have a signal or a sequence or a bit sequence okay. and uh, you want to transmit this over a wireless channel. Okay. So, typically what happens is in the channel you will have some noise that will get added to your signal, correct. Some noise will get added to the signal in the channel, right? So, how do you know what is the channel condition 
the way to know it is to predefine a sequence right so i'll say in the beginning itself i'm going to transmit some let's say 10110110110111 some sequence like that okay and so this is the transmitter this sequence is what i'm going to transmit some noise is got added and what does the receiver receive receiver may receive let's say you know 0 1 0 1 0 1 0 1 something like that it receives right now the receiver knows that it was supposed to receive this okay this is called the training sequence okay so the receiver knows that it was supposed to receive this training sequence but instead of receiving the se training sequence this is the received sequence right so if i compare both these sequences i can estimate the noise in the channel right if it is the same then i have a good channel right there is no noise in my channel if there are one or two bits off i know that there is some noise in the channel so i can estimate the channel condition so appropriately i may have certain error protection or error recovery mechanisms okay <clears throat> is that make sense okay so that's basically what we are trying to do with the training sequence here okay so the training sequence is for channel synchronization or or uh, estimating the channel condition okay <clears throat> everybody agrees why does it come in the middle typically you would put it in the beginning okay because it's a wireless channel on the other hand if i put it in the middle i can assume that more or less this is what held here and more or less that's what holds here so by and large i can recover both parts of my data if i put the training sequence in the middle instead of at the beginning okay that is the key reason if i put it in the beginning then it will hold for certain amount of bits after that but then it may drift off if i put it in the middle i know that it holds for what came before and holds for what came after that is the reason okay is that making sense okay so what are these one one bits here what does it say it says one signaling bit so those are actually not separators uh, they are flags which are called stealing flag okay the stealing flag is like for emergencies when you want to send control information in a data channel okay when would you want to when would you have an emergency as far as a mobile is concerned ha huh, when there is a imminent hand off right suddenly there is a ongoing call and suddenly i find that the base station with wh with whom i am communicating the received power has gone down drastically so there is an imminent hand off but i can't wait for sending a packet on the associated control channel because that may take a while to come so i just have to send it immediately in the data channel itself so at that point what the mobile does is it sets one of these flags so once the flag is set what it means is the following data is not voice data but it is control data okay so that's what is the meaning of a stealing flag okay okay what is 8.25 guard bits 8.25 is not guard bits actually it is guard time okay so since we are saying 577 microseconds and if you convert all of this it will come to uh, slightly short of 9 bits so it's 8.25 so it's not like don't think of it as bits but it's a certain amount of time which is left vacant on the channel guard time it is okay okay <coughs> so on the air interface we have seen that there is a traffic channel broadcast channel control channel dedicated control channel ha huh, there is also something called an associated control channel which is basically used when there is a traffic channel existing okay if there is no traffic channel then i live only with a dedicated control channel if there is a traffic channel then there is an associated control channel okay so i guess most of these things you will know okay so let's come to one interesting aspect okay so ignore all these things full rate traffic channel half rate traffic channel and all those things so what we want to understand is let's go back to traffic channel okay 
okay, traffic channel we saw that there are 57 bits plus 57 bits. Okay. In each frame we have 57 bits of data and then there is some other 57 bits of data that come in. Okay. So, what we will try to understand now is what is it that we need to keep in mind? Why is there no CRC? See when do I need CRC? I need CRC for error detection. right? So, there is no use for me to do error detection. Again here see there is a trade off. Now, because my channel is a very important resource, I do not mind putting in extra effort to do error protection. I, do, I cannot afford to have error detection in my system because error detection is always followed by typically followed by retransmission. Okay. So, I do not want any retransmission in my system that is a waste of uh, channel resources. Okay. So, in a GSM system there is error protection instead of detection and retransmission. Okay. So, the idea why it is to be done is fairly straightforward. I want to save my, I want to just simply avoid retransmission. I do not want to do any retransmission, but at the same time I want maximum amount of the data to go across. Right? So, now the question is how does it do error protection? Okay. So, one thing <coughs> we have to understand is that it does not transmit the voice as it is. Okay. So, what we are, what we may assume is that uh, have you wondered why your friend's voice, the same friend's voice sounds different on a landline versus a mobile versus real? Why is that so? How many of you have noticed that is true? Right? Many people have noticed. right? Why does the voice sound different in each system? Okay, so, why, what happens with voice? Voice I am going to sample. Okay. So, I am going to sample voice and I am going to generate a bunch of bits. Okay. So, if it is an analog system or if it is a wired system, it does not matter to me, I send the whole thing, I send the full sample. Let me just say speech is sampled and in a PSTN line, this can be packetized or in any other voice over IP line it can be packetized or digitized or whatever right and transmitted that is a typical way in which i could do that all right what happens in gsm again i don't want to waste my bits on the air so i don't want to send all the sampled bits okay <clears throat> so in gsm what it does is after the sampling okay it has something called a model uses what are called vocoders, okay, voice coders. Okay. <clears throat> so, this has a model of human speech, voice box. Okay. So, what instead of the entire sampling being transmitted, what it is transmitting is basically uh, <clears throat> vocal cord frequency x, excitation energy y. Okay, just transmitting key parameters. Okay. <clears throat> so, these are the parameters that are being transmitted. So, instead of transmitting the entire sampled speech, it just models this voice and it transmits saying that okay, for this frequency of vocal cord frequency, so much is the energy that you have to supply and so on. So, these are the things that go and at the other end, So, at the other end the speech gets synthesized again you have the same model it just supplies that uh, for that particular vocal cord frequency it supplies that much excitation energy and that is why your friend's voice sounds different because this is synthetic speech it is not the sampled speech as it is which is what you would have heard in this case correct. Okay. So, what we now have is a bunch of bits now. Okay. What are our bunch of bits? We have bits saying corresponding to the vocal cord frequency and the different excitation energies. Okay. <clears throat> so, now see what happens in your GSM system. Okay. So, what it does is this is how it does the error protection. First, it does speech coding for 20 millisecond segments which results in 260 bits at the output. Okay. After I do all this vocoder business. 20 milliseconds of speech 
after sampling and after going through the vocoder comes to 260 bits at the output. Okay. Now out of these also <coughs> certain frequencies are more important, right? certain other frequencies are less important of the human voice. Right? Now <coughs> so what it does is it does what are called unequal error protection. What is the simplest error protection mechanism? Repeat. Right? So that is the most simplest error protection mechanism. You transmit the same information twice. So <coughs> you find that in this case out of these 260 bits you have 182 bits which are protected. Okay? So basically 50 bits are taken and you add 132 bits of protection information to it to ensure because these are the critical 50 bits to ensure that these bits <coughs> are, not, are not lost under any circumstance. If those bits are lost then you can't hear at the other end. You can't make out what you are hearing. The other 78 bits which are unprotected they are only going to add to the quality of the voice that you are hearing but they are not essential so you leave them unprotected. Okay? So then what happens is <coughs> the channel it codes the 260 bits into 8 into 57 bit blocks of 456 bits. Okay? Let me come to this in a moment. <coughs> okay. So see what is happening you have speech 20 milliseconds of speech is taken to 260 bits. Okay. 260 bits is encoded into 456 bits. Is that making sense? Channel encoding is where you are going to uh, you can say kind of add the additional modulation information everything. Okay. So this is basically what you have to transmit on the channel. 456 bits have to be transmitted on the channel. Okay. How many levels of error protection are over already? One level of error protection is over here because in these 260 bits we know that 50 bits are very important and they have been you know protected by adding them twice and so on. Okay? So now we come to this 456 bits. What does it do with the 456 bits? Now that is also very interesting. It does something called block interleaving. <coughs> so I have 456 bits which come from the first 20 milliseconds of speech. I have another 456 bits which come from the second 20 milliseconds of speech. Okay? So now this 456 bits you chop into 8 bits of uh, 57 bits, okay? 8, 8 chunks of 57 bits. All right? <coughs> so this, is, this blue thing is the first 57 bits from here. This blue thing is the first 57 bits from here. Okay? So you remember that in my normal frame what did I have? I have two 57 bits in the packet that I am going to transmit. Right? So what it does is it takes this 57 bits puts it in the first half here of the normal burst. It takes the other 57 bits and puts it in the second half of the normal burst. Understand? So in one packet what it is doing is it is not even sending two speech portions which have any connection with each other. It is sending 20 milliseconds from what I said 20 milliseconds ago and it is sending 20 milliseconds uh, and it is sending 57 bits from what I am saying now. Okay, why? Again if one of these is lost because human voice and the human mind can reconstruct the voice even if one of these 57 bits is lost that entire 20 milliseconds is not lost. Is that making sense? So this 260 bits from here 157 bits have come here from here 157 bits have come here that is what is going in one frame. Okay. So this is called block interleaving. Okay, so it has done one level of uh, error protection. Okay. <coughs> so error protection, the first is 260 bits. I have 182 bits protected, correct? Second one is block interleaving, okay, which is which basically means 57 bits of two different speech segments. Right? Third one is again another interesting thing which it does which is called bit interleaving. Okay? So the third thing is actually straightforward. So what it does is, is with these 57 bits, okay, what does it do? Okay? 
it writes the 57 bits into an array in a row wise manner okay and read column wise okay what is the effect of this huh. what happens as a result of this is that see all our speech error recovery techniques work if there are one or two bits here and there which are in error okay if a huge chunk of bits are lost which are contiguous then the error recovery mechanism becomes hard okay so i am basically going to write my data in this manner okay so these are actually our contiguous bits okay those are the contiguous bits right <coughs> so when i read it column wise what happens contiguous bits get separated out okay now when this goes out on the onto the network even if there is a burst error here what will i do at the other end at the receiver's end this is the transmitter end this is the receiver end right so in the receiver end i am again going to write it column wise and read it row wise correct so because i am doing this what happens is any errors that are burst errors in the channel show up as random errors in my block okay <clears throat> so these are the three important ways in which gsm tries to protect against errors okay one is doing error protection for some of the data itself okay by doubly transmitting it or whatever then it does block interleaving and finally it does bit interleaving at the uh, before transmitting on the channel <coughs> okay so that's how we get here okay so since most people are desperate for a break i'll stop here <coughs>